welcome back to the digressor. Today's episode, I, I have been wanting to do this one for a while, but I, I'm not very good at story-based episodes. Um, I'm more, I more talk about things than tell a story. Which, I don't know, this is more of a story thing than a just talk about it. And so, I thought I would, I would still try. And I am, of course, talking about, if you saw the title of the episode, you know what I'm going to talk about. And that is the Hindenburg. I actually have to look this up. This is going to be mostly... A, um, a Wikipedia episode. I'm just going to say right now. Because... <clears throat> my script is Wikipedia. For the most part, basically. And the actual name of the Hindenburg, it's actually... Uh, LZ129 Hindenburg. And it is... It is a Hindenburg Clash... There were two Hindenburg class airships. They were hydrogen filled passenger carrying rigid airships built in Germany in the 1930s and named in honor of Paul von Hindenburg, which I'm guessing he was, I think he was the president of, let's see. Ah, Paul Lud, uh, Ludwig Hans Anton von Beneckendorf und von Hindenburg. Oh, wait, there's a listen thing. Uh, listen. It's not working. Oh, wait, I have to open the thing first. Connection failure? Okay. Um, using edge. Okay. Paul Ludwig Hans Anton von Beneckendorf und von Hindenburg. That, 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 um, that's his name. He was a German general and statesman who led the Imperial German Army during World War One. I. I was wrong. He wasn't president of Germany. He was the that. Wait, it continues, and later became president of Germany. Okay, it was. He was the president of Germany. <laughs> I was wrong about being wrong. From 1925 until his death in 1934, during his presidency, he played a key role in the Nazi. Much ter. Griefing. Let's see if that one has a listen. It does not. It doesn't even have a pronunciation thing. Uh, he appointed Adolf Hitler as Chancellor of Germany. Ah, so we have him to blame. Okay, there we go. Um, anyway, the airships. They were the last such aircraft ever built, and in terms of their length and volume, the largest Zeppelins ever to fly. During the 1930s, airships like the Hindenburg class were widely considered the future of air travel. I wish they were. I. My first experience with a with a Zeppelin, it's not really experience. It's not my experience. It was my my first time ever seeing a Zeppelin at all before I even heard of Hindenburg, was in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade when him and his father, they they actually ride a Zeppelin. And I was like, wow, they're riding a giant blimp. Yeah, I, I thought it was a blimp. <laughs> but, so yeah, the Zeppelins, they were actually, there were, there was Hindenburg's actually two. The second one was actually, the, uh, the one that I'm going to talk about is actually the first Hindenburg in the Hindenburg class. And the second one wasn't even called Hindenburg. <clears throat> it was called the LZ-130 Graf Zeppelin. And I just got to pop up and go away. Anyway, uh, it says that it never operated on a regular passenger service and was scrapped in 1940 by order of Hermann Goring. 
So, there were two airships in the Hindenburg class, but the second one never actually launched. So, yeah, that that one uh, pretty much was only one ever, really. There's a picture of it. Um, I'm going to put it in the video version. And there's a picture of it. I don't know if it ever flew. I'm going to look in the thing. Oh. Uh, apparently there were 30 flights. So I don't know. Oh, let's see. Operational history. In total, the Graf Zeppelin made 30 flights. Covering 36, 550 kilometers in. And a total airtime of 409 hours. It did fly. Wait. So the uh, maiden voyage was on 14th of September 1938. The maiden voyage took place immediately after the christening of the ship under the command of Eckner. Let's see who that is. I think I know who they're talking about. He's like the guy who designed the Zeppelins. I gotta find his name. Let's see. The Zeppelin. Look at the Zeppelin. I don't see... Oh, it's... Oh, Zeppelins were actually named after a person. Ah! That's something I didn't know. It's named after Ferdinand von Zeppelin. Let's look up his Wikipedia. He... Wow, he died in 1917. <clears throat> he was a German general and later inventor of the Zeppelin rigid airships, founding the company... Lustschiff... No, not going to... I'm, most of these words are in German, and I'm not going to try to pronounce them all. Uh, I know that Urquhart, Urquhart person, I, uh, oh, Hugo Erkner, Eckner, there he is. <clears throat> he was the manager of the Zeppelin company, whose first word I can't pronounce, during the interwar years. And also the commander of the famous Graf Zeppelin for the mo for most of its record-setting flights. So, yeah. Go back to the main Hindenburg that I was talking about. Let's go back to where is it? History, operational history. Ah, yes. So, use of hydrogen instead of helium. Helium was initially selected for the lifting gas because it was the safest to use in airships as it was not flammable. One proposed measure to save helium was to make double gas cells for 14 of the 16 gas cells. An inner hydrogen cell would be protected by an outer cell filled with helium with vertical ducting to the dorsal area of the envelope to per permit separate filling and venting of the inner hydrogen cells. At the time, however, helium was also relatively rare and extremely expensive as a gas as the gas was available in industrial quantities only from distillation plants at certain oil fields in the United States. Hydrogen, by comparison, could be cheaply produced by any industrialized nation and being lighter than helium also provided more lift. Because of its expense and rarity, American rigid airships using helium were forced to conserve the gas at all costs and this hampered their operation. <clears throat> so, they could have used helium, but it was kind of expensive. So... Operational history of the Hindenburg launching and trial flights. There's a picture of it in his Hindenburg on its first flight on March 4th, 1936. The name of the airship was not yet painted on the hull. Five years after construction began in 1931, Hindenburg made its maiden test flight from the Zeppelin dockyards at Friedrichshafen. On March 4th, 1936, with 87 passengers and crew on board. These included the Zeppelin Company chairman, Dr. Hugo Eckner, as commander, former World War I Zeppelin commander, 
Lieutenant Colonel Joachim Person, representing the German Air Ministry, the Zeppelin Company's eight airships, airship captains, 27, uh, 47 of their crew members, and 30 dockyard employees who flew as passengers. Harold, Harold G. Dick was the only non-company representative aboard, although the name Hindenburg had quiet, had been quietly selected by Eckner over the year uh, over an, a year earlier. Only the airship's formal registration number, DLZ-129, and the five Olympic ranks promoting the 1936 Summer Olympics to be held in Berlin that August were displayed on the hull during its trial flights. As the airship passed over Munich on its second trial flight the, f the next afternoon, the city's Lord Mayor, Karl Feilner, asked Eckner by radio the LZ-129's name, which he replied Hindenburg. On March 23rd, Hindenburg made its first passenger in mail flight, carrying 30 re uh, 80 reporters from Friedrichsfin to Lauenthal. The ship flew over Lake Constance with with Grand Zeppelin. The name Hindenburg, lettered in 1.8 meter, it's 5 foot 11 inch high red script, designed by Berlin advertiser George Wagner, was added to its hull three weeks later before the uh, Deutschlandfurt on March 26. No formal naming ceremony for the aircraft was aircraft was ever held. I actually read somewhere, and I don't see it on here, that the uh, that Hitler wanted the name, wanted the uh, the name of the ship to be Adolf Hitler, obviously, because it's himself. Can you imagine? How, <laughs> can you imagine how different history would be? It'd be hard to report that, and it would be hard to talk about that I would have to name this episode something else it's like the LZ 129 Adolf Hitler or something because I don't want to call it Adolf Hitler like, well, you're talking about that guy like no 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 and I lost my spot because I went up looking for where the name was yeah uh, let's see but yeah, it. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is the. Uh, it was a basically a Nazi propaganda ship, for the most part. They, uh, the Hugo Eckner guy, who was like a huge deal. Um, he actually, you know, he's he was German. He worked in Germany. He wasn't too fond of the Nazis, and uh, but the Nazi party they actually helped fund the Zeppelin, so kind of as a compromise, he had to put the swastikas on the tail fins of the Zeppelin, which, yeah, not exactly the best thing, but, uh, yeah. Anyway, the scrolling down further... Uh, what, where am I? Although designed and built for commercial transatlantic passenger air freight, uh, notification. Uh, although designed and built for commercial transatlantic passenger air freight, air freight and mail service, at the behest of the Reich Ministry for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, Hindenburg was first pressed into use by the Air Ministry as a vehicle to deliver Nazi propaganda. Oh, if I had just kept reading, I wouldn't have had to stop to explain that. On March 7th, 1936, ground forces of the German Reich had entered and occupied the Rhineland, a region bordering France which had been designated in the 1919 Treaty of Versailles <coughs> as a demilitarized zone established to provide a buffer between Germany and that neighboring country. In order to justify its remilitarization, which was also a violation of the 1925 
Carno Pack, a post hoc referendum was quickly called by Hitler for, for March 29th to ask the German people to both rat ratify the Rhineland's occupation by the German army <coughs> wow. and to approve a single party list composed exclusively of Nazi candidates to sit in the new Reichstag. The Hindenburg and the Graf Zeppelin were designed by the government as a key part of the process. As a public relations ploy, Propaganda Minister Joseph G uh, Goebbels uh, demanded that the Zeppelin Company make the two airships available to fly in tandem around Germany over the four-day period prior to the voting with a joint departure from Lowenthal on the morning of March 26. While gusty wind conditions that morning would prove to make the process of safely launching the new airship a difficult one, Hindenburg's commander, Captain Ernest La uh, Lehmann, was determined to impress the politicians, Nazi, politic uh, Nazi party off officials, and press present at the airfield with an on-time departure and thus proceeded with its launch despite the adverse conditions. As the massive airship began to rise under full engine power, she was caught by a 35-degree crosswind gust, causing her lower vertical tail fin to strike and be dragged across the ground, resulting in sufficient dam uh, significant damage to the bottom portion of the airfoil and its attached rudder. Zeppelin Company Chairman Eckner, who had opposed the joint flight to get both because it politicized the airships and had forced the cancellation of an essential final endurance test for Hindenburg, was furious and rebuked uh, Lehmann. See, that Eckner, he, he wasn't a Nazi sympathizer. <laughs> He didn't. He didn't want to do the whole showy. Look at this propaganda thing. So he wanted to do things the right way. <clears throat> Graf Zeppelin, which had wait, I thought I missed something. Graf Zeppelin, which had been hovering above the airfield waiting for Hindenburg to join it, had to start off on the propaganda mission alone. While LZ-129 returned to her hangar, their temporary repairs were quickly made to its. Uh, uh, Impanage. I, I don't know that word. Oh, I had to look at it. It's a Wikipedia article, and I tap it, and it's a tail. Why did it just say that? Before joining up with the smaller airship several hours later. As millions of Germans watched from below, the two giants of the sky sailed over Germany f for the next four days and three nights, dropping pap pro propaganda leaflets, bla uh, blaring m martial music, and slogans from large loudspeakers and broadcasting political speeches from a makeshift radio station above aboard Hindenburg. So the yeah, with the completion of voting on the referendum which the German government claimed to be approved by a 98.79% yes vote the Hindenburg returned to Lowenthal on March 29th to prepare for its first commercial passenger flight, a transatlantic passage to Rio de Janeiro, scheduled for uh, scheduled to depart there from there on March 31st. Hugo Eckner was not to be the commander of the flight, however, but was said to uh, in, in, relegated to being a supervisor with no operational control over Hindenburg. Well. Ernest Lemon had command of the airship. To add insult to injury, Eckner learned from a, the, an Associated Press reporter upon Hindenburg's arrival in, Re, in Rio that Goebbels had also followed through on his month-old threat to decree that Eckner's name would no longer be mentioned in German newspapers and periodicals, and no pictures nor articles about him shall be printed. This action was taken because of Erkner's op uh, opposition to using Hindenburg and Graf Zeppelin for political purposes and his refusal to give a special appeal during the uh, Reichstag election campaign endorsing Chancellor Adolf Hitler and his policies. The existence of the ban was never publicly acknowledged by Goebbels and it was lifted uh, quietly lifted a month later. So basically because he wasn't an Nazi sympathizer they didn't want to acknowledge him as having anything to do with this. Basically, it sounds like they didn't even acknowledge his existence at all. 
which uh, really doesn't surprise me. While in while at Rio, the, the crew noticed that one of the engines had noticeable carbon buildup from being run at low speed during the propaganda flight days earlier. On the return flight from South America, the automatic valve of gas cell 3 st stuck open. Gas was transferred from other, other cells through an inflation rate, a inflation line. It was never understood why the valve stuck open, and subsequently the, the crew used only the hand-operated maneuvering valves for cells 2 and 3. 38 hours after departure, one of the airship's four uh, Daimler bins 16-cylinder diesel engines suffered a wrist pin breakage, damaging the piston and cylinder. Repairs were started immediately, and the engine function on 15 cylinders uh, for the remainder of the flight. Four, four hours after engine four failed, engine number two was shut down as one of the two bearing caps bolts for the engine crankshaft failed and the cap fell into the crankcase. The cap room was removed and the engine was run again, but when the ship was off Cape Doobie, the second cap broke and the engine was shut down again. The engine was not run again to prevent further damage. With three engines operating at a speed of 100.7 uh, kilometers per hour, which is 62.6 .6 miles per hour, the headwinds r reported over the English Canal, uh, English Channel. The crew raised the airship in search of counter trade winds, usually found above 1,500 meters. Well beyond the ship's pressure altitude, unexpectedly the crew found such a wind at the lower altitude of 1100 meters, which prevented them to guide the airship safely back to Germany after gaining emergency permission from Germany to fly a more direct route over the Wone Valley. The nine-day flight covered 20,529 kilometers in 203 hours and 32 minutes of flight time all four engines were later overhauled and no and no further problems were encountered in later flights For the rest of april hindenburg remained at her had her, her hangar where the engines were overhauled and the lower fin and rudder received a final repair the ground clearance of the lower rudder was increased to 8 to 14 degrees so basically from the beginning of the transatlantic passenger flights, they were having problems with the Hindenburg. And it sounded like really bad ones. Uh, I don't know much about... I didn't know... I didn't understand most of what I read there. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> I have no idea what most of that meant. Um, but it still sounded bad. Like, even, with, even though I don't know what it meant, it sounded really bad. So that'll come into play later. I do know that. Um, let's skip. There was a several. There were, I think, um, yeah. There were ten flights that went successfully, and now I'm going to talk about the flight, um, the final flight of the Hindenburg. The one that everyone knows about. After making the first South American flight on the uh, of the 1937 season in late March, Hindenburg left Frankfurt for Lake Lakehurst on the evening of the 3rd of May, 1937, on its first scheduled round trip between Europe and North America that season. Although strong headwinds slowed the crossing, the flight had otherwise proceeded routinely as she approached for a landing three days later. Hindenburg's arrival on the 6th of May was delayed for several hours to avoid a line of thunderstorms passing over Lakehurst, but around 7 p.m. the airshift was cleared for its final approach uh, uh, to the Naval Air Station, which she made at an altitude of 200 meters, which is 660 feet, with Captain Max Proust in command. At 
7:21 p.m. a pair of landing lights were dropped landing wow landing lines were dropped f uh, from the nose of the ship and were grabbed hold of by ground handlers uh, I, I looked away four minutes later at 1:25 p.m. Hindenburg burst into flames and dropped to the ground in li a little over half a minute. Of the 36 passengers and 61 crew aboard, 13 passengers and 22 crew died, as well as one member of the grand crew. A total of 39, uh, 36 lives lost. Herbert Morrison's commentary of the incident became a classic of audio history. And I know I never do this in my episodes, but I'm actually going to insert the audio clip of his very famous um, reporting um, into this. Uh, if you're watching the video version, I'm going to include the actual video clip with the audio. Now, this clip has always been... It's been parodied and memed and, you know, it's turned into a joke. People jokingly say, oh, the humanity, all the time. I grew up, before I even knew it was part of this, I would hear people say that as a joke. And I'd see it in, like, tiny tunes and, like, all these other things. But then you actually, if you listen to where it originated from, you were like, why are people joking about this? It's kind of, like, especially, like, you see what he's looking at and you hear it in his voice. And then people make fun of it. But anyway, here is the famous recording. It's starting to rain again. The rain had uh, cracked up a little bit. They back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It bursts into flames. Get it started. Get it started. It's right and it's rising. It's rising. Terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning, bursting into flames, and, and it's falling on the morning fast, and all the folks between us, this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, 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 it's like 20, oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen, the smoke and the flames now, and the flame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the morning mass. Oh, the humanity and all the fans are just feeding around it. I told you... <laughs> I can't even talk to people. His friends are out there. It's a, it's, it's a, oh. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honestly, it's just laying down massive smoking wreckage. And everybody can't hardly breathe and talk and screaming. Lady, I, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside while I cannot see it. Charlie, that's terrible. I, 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 I listen, folks. I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because they, I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. Well, they don't know exactly what caused the explosion. They, there has been many theories, as you would imagine, considering the you know the global scenario at the time uh, sabotage was one of the top theories that was the cause of it but they didn't find any actual evidence for that they uh, one of the most likely theories was one actually put, um, put forth by Hugo Erkner, Erkner I'm going to just call him Hugo. Hugo. <laughs> um, one of the best theories, actually, and the most likely one, actually, was proposed by him. And it was that it was a combination of different things. They, because they, there was, I watched a documentary earlier. It's called Titanic of the Skies. And it shows, it's kind of a, like, it's almost like a movie of it. It's a documentary and a movie. Um, and it shows that uh, 
they were in a hurry because like I because like the thing said they were they were actually it says they were several hours late they were 13 hours late so they were in a hurry because they were on a schedule they were passengers waiting to board so they can attend King George's coronation in, in, in London so they were behind schedule and so they were trying to hurry and a storm had just passed so yeah there was this like the static in the air and the, the ship like the ship the airship could only turn so fast you can't really turn it too fast and in an effort to try to speed things along the captain made a sharp turn which kind of bent the ship it kind of and it's theorized that one of the cables inside the ship snapped and sliced open one of the hydrogen bags and then with the static that's in the air because of the storm that just passed it set it off in the documentary and I've seen this before uh, one of the crew people on the ground actually noticed near the tail that the uh, the outer covering was fluttering in the wind like there was like gases underneath trying to get escape moments before it exploded and so that's a very likely cause of the explosion that's personally what I think um because like I said there there was no evidence of sabotage but the media they were like it was sabotage it was sabotage wasn't it yeah it was sabotage but Again, there was no evidence of it. That's why I like the... I want to I want to get his name right. Because I actually really like him. Because he was... Actually, it's searching. Uh, Hugo. I want to get his name right. Huh? Oh, I spelled it wrong. That would help if I spelled it right. Hugo Eckner. Hugo Eckner. Yes, him. He... He wasn't one of... Like, he did... Like I said, he wasn't a Nazi sympathizer. He wasn't... Um, he didn't want to go along with the propaganda, and the Nazi party wanted to say, oh, it was sabotage, and the media wanted to say it was sabotage, but he wanted to get the facts. He So he was like, I'm not saying it was anything until I know for a fact. And so he looked at the evidence and made his conclusion based on evidence, not on we want it to be sabotage so, you know, we can go to war, there's sensationalized or whatever. So, yeah, and it has a section here, Hindenburg in media. I know there was a movie made, I think it was like George C. Scott, or, I don't know, let me see. The Hindenburg is a 1975 film inspired by the disaster, but centered on the sabotage theory. Hmm. Some of these plot elements were based on the real bomb threats before the flight began, as well as proponents of the sabotage theory. The actual model from the movie is now on permanent display in the... The National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. It doesn't say who's in it. I'm pretty sure it was a George C. Scott movie. Yep, George C. Scott. I didn't really like the movie, though. I did see it a long, long time ago. It gets to... Cause, like The whole movie, I don't remember most of it. I only remember the ending, because that's what I was waiting for. I was waiting for the dramatized version of the event that we know. And it gets to the very end, and... It shows, I think, like, George C. Scott's character is, like, right there where the explosion is. And then it cuts to the arc, the, it cuts to that famous footage, the black and white footage of the explosion. And then the credits roll, like, no, that's not, no, stop it. <laughs> so, I didn't really like it. Actually, I want to, I'm going to look at the... I'm going to look at the reviews of the movie. Historical accuracy, ha. Huh? Although the film was largely accurate to its setting, there were numerous differences between the film and reality. Some aspects were added for dramatic purposes. The scene when the plot, when the port thins, fabric rips did not happen to the Hindenburg. But a similar event happened on the Graf Zeppelin during its first flight to America in 1928. Additionally, although the Hindenburg did have a specially constructed aluminum 
Blunther Baby Grand Piano aboard for the 1926, 1936 season. It was not aboard the final flight in 1937. While the interior... This is bad. Okay. Now it's just nitpicking. I'm looking at reception. Although well received by the public as typical disaster movie fare, critical reception for the Hindenburg was generally unfavorable. Roger, Ebert, Roger Ebert's one-star review from the Chicago Sun-Times dismissed it as a failed project, writing, The Hindenburg is a disaster picture, all right. How else can you describe a movie that costs $12 million and makes people laugh out loud at all the wrong times? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, let's see. Let's go to the... Go to the plot of the movie. Here. Scrolling up. Okay, plot. Um, I can't even find it. I don't even care. I'm going back. <laughs> um, the image of the burning airship was used as the cover of Led Zeppelin's self-titled debut album. Which, yeah, I remember that. Uh, Charlie Chan was a passenger aboard the Hindenburg in the film Charlie Chan and the Olympics. I don't know that film. 1937 film. Uh, okay. So that's the only time... They need to make a new movie. That would be really cool. Uh, that is a missed opportunity because a lot of people don't even know like much about the Hindenburg because I was telling to them, I was telling some people that I was gonna do this episode, and they're like, "What's the Hindenburg?" They they know a lot of people know the Hindenburg as you know the explosion picture and oh the humanity. Um, but they don't know, like, anything about it, like the fact that it was German, it wasn't its first flight, uh, it was actually very successful, like, it was, um, an entire industry, I think it started in 1919, and after the disaster, Zeppelin just stopped being a thing, like, um, because, like, after this, airlines became a thing like they became like airplanes like passenger airplanes became the norm after that and people didn't want to do air these airships anymore zeppelins but i think they should still have them like not as i don't know like a fun thing like could you experience what a zeppelin is because apparently cause I've, I've flown in a plane and those things are like very bumpy like especially like before you get up to like the 30,000 feet or whatever and then once you get up there it's it's smooth and then you hit turbulence but then like I, I read and I hear so much about the zeppelins they were smooth like there was none of that it's all shaky until you get up. it's like I was reading a review of I think was, um, somebody wrote down their experiences on a zeppelin and she didn't even notice that they had taken off. She was like, she, she was like, sitting there waiting, like waiting for them to take off. And she looked out the window and oh, we're already in the air. Like that would never be a thing with a plane. With the plane, you're taxiing down the runway, and all of a sudden they speed up like really, really, really fast. And kind of gave me it gave me anxiety like really bad. And so they should still have airships, even if it's just like. A novelty thing. It's just like we're gonna go from here to there, like short distance, like one side of town to the other, and then back or whatever. Just something so you can experience an airship or something. I just I think that would have been really cool. And uh, going back to the Led Zeppelin album. Yep. 
That is their cover. Um, I actually remember that. That's actually when I, I didn't know. Like my first time I ever saw anything with the with with uh, Hindenburg was that cover, and I didn't know that it was an actual thing. I just thought I didn't know what a Zeppelin was. So what, even now when I hear Zeppelin, I think Led Zeppelin. And <laughs> so when I found out that when I first time I heard about Hindenburg, I was like, "What's that?" And someone showed me the the famous picture. I'm like, "Oh, that's the, the album cover." And they're like, uh, "No, they took this picture and made it the album cover." What? <laughs> Wait, I saw something. Uh... I'm confused. Um, <laughs> oh. Okay, well, the artwork. I'm going to read the artwork section of the album cover. Led Zeppelin's co uh, front cover, which was chosen by Jimmy Page, features a black and white image of a burning of the burning Hindenburg airship. Photographed by Sam Shearer on 6th of May, 1937, during the Hindenburg disaster. The image re uh, refers to the origin of the band's name itself. When Paige Beck and Who's Keith Moon and John Entwistle, I don't think I know who that is, were discussing the idea of forming a group, Moon joked it would possibly go over like a lead balloon, and Entwistle reportedly replied, a lead zeppelin. The book cover. The back cover features a photograph of the band talking to Dredge. The entire design of the album sleeve was coordinated by George Hardy, Hardy, with whom the band would continue to collaborate for future sleeves. Hardy himself also created the front cover illustration, rendering the famous original black and white photograph in ink using a uh, rapidograph technical pen and a mezzotint technique. Hardy recalled that he originally offered the band a design based on an old club design in San Francisco, a multi-sequential image of a Zeppelin airship up in the clouds. Zeppelin declined, I mean, um, Page declined, but was retained as the logo for the back cover of Zeppelin, the Zeppelin's first two albums and a number of early press advertisements. The first UK pressing featured the band name and the Atlantic logo in turquoise. When it was switched to the orange print later that year, the turquoise print sleeve became a collector's item. I was going to say, wasn't it red? Apparently it's orange. The album's cover gained further widespread attention when uh, at a February 20, uh, wow, 1970 gig in Copenhagen, the band were billed as the knobs as a result of a legal threat from the aristocrat Eva von Zeppelin, a relative of the creator of the Zeppelin aircraft. Von Zeppelin, upon seeing the logo of the Hindenburg crashing in flames, threatened legal action over the, the concert taking place. In 2001, Greg Cott wrote, for Roll wrote in Rolling Stone that the cover of Led Zeppelin shows the Hindenburg airship in all its glory going down in flames. The image did a pretty good job of encapsulating the music inside. Sex, catastrophe, and things blowing up. So why would she sue for that? That seems weird. Because like it's like a public domain image type thing. I don't know. Uh... And that's all I got for that. <laughs> I still think that they should do a Hinden a new Hindenburg movie, the one that actually follows the real events. That would be really cool. I actually um I saw a video years ago showing the uh that hangar in Frankfurt, New Jersey now. It has. Uh, it still looks the way it did back then, uh, and they have a plaque there. And then, uh, in the in like on the ground where the Hindenburg laid, there's now like it's there's cement and like 
the names of all the people that died and like a, memor a memorial thing there. It looks really cool and I want to go. It would look really, it would be really nice to go there. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's all I've got on this subject. I will I will end this now and uh, yeah, bye.